Now we're going to be talking about what we want legalization to be, what we want, what legalization should look like, or what the repeal of marijuana prohibition should look like. And you know, when we launched the Sensible BC campaign, we had a very specific piece of legislation, the Sensible Policing Act, and that was written mainly by Kirk Tusaw here. But when we put that together, we tried to figure out what the province could do, what our goals were, and what Elections BC would accept as a valid legislation for an initiative. Then once we'd written the basic outline, we went to all the different groups that we could find and asked them what they thought and got feedback and made changes when needed to try to create something that we could get the broadest possible uh, coalition for and the greatest number of endorsements for our legislation. And uh, now what we want to do is a very similar kind of thing in terms of what we're really looking for in the long run what we want our federal government to pass, what we want our provincial governments to pass, and even what kind of bylaws you want to see municipalities pass, and what legalization is really going to mean. And maybe some of the discussion around what kind of compromises we're willing to make as a movement. You know, what are the things that are the key things that we need, the things that if they're missing, we would oppose legalization, and what are the things that we might like to have, maybe we could wait for those for the second round of battling after we get some kind of initial legislation through. And uh, so my goal is to use this as the beginning of this kind of conversation and then to take what we come out of this here, to use that to create some basic uh, legislation and some ideas and then continue that process over the next few months. And actually tomorrow morning you'll have a chance, if, this is, if you enjoy this and you want to learn more, uh, Mark Hayden, a fellow here, is going to be hosting a, a panel discussion, to, or a, not a panel discussion, but a workshop tomorrow morning uh, that will give us a chance to get more in the nitty gritty of what we're looking at. Um, but this will just be a preliminary kind of a discussion and a chance for us to get a, get a grip on what we're really asking for when we ask for marijuana to be legalized and what that really means and what, what we want out of that. So um, our panel is Kirk Tusaw. Uh, Kirk's a wonderful lawyer who's uh, won us a number of important constitutional challenges and has been very uh, instrumental in uh, getting the marijuana movement and the medical marijuana movement advanced through the courts. I'll introduce everybody, but I'll let, well, no, let's let Kirk talk first, actually. That, that's Kirk. He's a great guy. He'll be talking first, and then I'll introduce the other ones as we get to them. Thanks very much, Dana. So they'll each talk about five, ten minutes, and then we're going to have a discussion after that. So take it away, Kirk. Th thanks very much, Dana, and, uh, and thanks to Sensible BC for the opportunity to come to this conference and talk to everybody and for um, really putting on a, what's been an incredible event uh, so far and looks to be an incredible event as well uh, tomorrow. Um, I think that uh, what I'd like to sort of talk about a little bit is is not so much the nitty gritty as as we say we'll get into that a bit tomorrow morning at uh, Mark's workshop and I would encourage anybody interested in uh, the sort of details of uh, regulating cannabis in a post prohibition environment to go and, and listen to Mark uh, speak. I've had the opportunity to hear him many times. He's fantastic uh, and and has a very comprehensive view of um, really all those details you need to think about. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the general framework in Canada uh, from a legal perspective uh, and try to highlight a little bit of um, how we can get to uh, legalization and what the mechanisms are and, and really where we should be directing our focus and our energies as uh, cannabis policy reform activists, people that are working in this movement uh, so hard. It's actually, as a matter of technical law, a very simple thing to end cannabis prohibition. Um, Section 60 of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act says that the governor and council may by order amend any of the schedules, uh, the schedules to the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act by adding to them or deleting from them any item or portion of an item where the governor and general, uh, governor and council deems the amendment to be necessary in the public interest. That's Section 60 of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. What does that really mean? That means the Governor General, who is uh, the Queen's representative in Canada, uh, who acts at the direction of uh, the federal cabinet, the federal cabinet traditionally composed of the ministers uh, in the government that's ruling Canada, so the conservative ministers and, and the prime minister, um, can direct the Governor General to amend the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act and can direct the Governor General to remove cannabis from the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act and literally with the stroke of a pen by order in council with no vote of parliament, uh, required whatsoever, uh, marijuana would be legal. Cannabis would be legal in Canada. It would no longer be uh, controlled by the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. There would no longer be offenses related to its production, possession, trafficking, uh, any of those kinds of things. Uh, and the Governor uh, General could 
um, remove all of Schedule 2 to the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, which is cannabis, marijuana, and all of, generally speaking, all of the active ingredients in cannabis, including synthetic, uh, THC, pure THC, CBD, all of those kinds of things, uh, or could amend and remove just portions of uh, those listed items in Schedule 2 of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. So, for example, you could leave in uh, certain aspects of cannabis and derivatives, synthetic cannabis, for example, uh, in the CDSA, and everything else would then come out. Uh, there's a lot of uh, legislative flexibility there, really, Parliament. It's really executive flexibility because, as I say, this would not require uh, any vote uh, in the House of Commons whatsoever. It could literally be done tomorrow with the stroke of a pen. The difficulty and the devil, of course, is in the details. What, what happens next? What fills that regulatory void? Because uh, surely, um, while some of us may want to move to a system of complete unregulated uh, environment, uh, I don't think any government is going to do that, and it's probably not responsible for the government to do that. So what happens uh, next in those details? Uh, and I won't get into sort of the granularity of each individual item that, that could be up for uh, regulation. I want to talk more about the framework. Uh, what would happen uh, almost immediately, let's say hypothetically uh, uh, David Johnston, who's the governor general, gets the, gets the call from Stephen Harper. Stephen Harper says, hey, it's time. <laughs> just, just take it out, man. Just I've had enough. Um, in this mythical future, um, <laughs> There remain still regulatory environments that would relate to cannabis. One th major change that would occur instantly would be that cannabis that is uh, produced and sold and marketed at, for medical consumption would no longer fall into the CDSA. It, it would fall into the natural health product regulations, which is a regulatory scheme that governs things like St. John's, Word or Echinacea, basically all plants that are manufactured and sold with the intention of being used to treat medical conditions. And it's the intention that's important. Uh, there would not be uh, anything uh, for non-medical uh, regulation at that point. And so the logical next question is, okay, we want something in place, and what's that going to look like, uh, and how do we get there? And, and really, who should we be talking to about what that looks like? Because in Canada, in, in our system of federal government, uh, federalism, uh, where the federal government is supreme to the provincial governments in certain areas of jurisdiction, there's nevertheless a split of where the responsibility lies. It, it's clear from the case of Malmo Levine in the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, where the uh, constitutionality of, of the simple possession prohibition was challenged unsuccessfully, uh, but resulting in a fairly strong dissent from uh, several Supreme Court justices, um, the government can use the criminal law power to uh, prohibit cannabis. But the minute it's no longer criminal, the criminal law power is no longer applicable. Um, the federal government is, however, entitled to continue to regulate in certain areas. Uh, as I say, jurisdiction to regulate in Canada is divided amongst uh, the federal and provincial governments in the Constitution Act. The municipal governments, the local governments, get their powers by delegation, delegation from the provinces. So there's really a split between the feds and the provinces. The, the feds would still be entitled to uh, regulate in particularly commercial areas. And so, you know, what's, what's a good example of that is perhaps tobacco. Tobacco, uh, there's a Tobacco Act federally. There's also a Tobacco Control Act in British Columbia. Uh, and there's some overlap between the two. But the minute you get into sort of the commercial uh, production, marketing, labeling, and sale uh, of tobacco, it is regulated at the federal level. Um, things like time, place, and manner restrictions on retail outlets selling tobacco are not uh, controlled at the federal level. They're controlled <laughs> provincially slash municipally. Uh, and so it's important to know with whom you should be having a conversation uh, on any particular issue uh, of relevance to a post-prohibition regulatory environment. Um, I think that in a post-prohibition environment, the federal government's still going to have a role to play. Uh, it's going to probably have a primary role to play in the commercial area, uh, as, as I've indicated. But there should also be uh, exemptions for uh, personal, non-commercial production uh, of cannabis. And there is for tobacco. Uh, I, think, I think you can grow tobacco and possess up to 15 kilograms uh, of tobacco for each person in your household that's over 18 years of age. 
Well, that's a lot of tobacco. Uh, I don't know about people's tobacco consumption rates, but that strikes me as more than an adequate supply of tobacco for uh, one's uh, recreational consumption or whatever purpose one consumes. And I think that something similar to that could be and should be achievable for cannabis. The granularity of how you regulate that uh, personal production however, wouldn't really be at the federal level. The, the federal government isn't inspecting home tobacco grows and telling you, you know, how you're supposed to do it and what nutrients you can use and what pesticides you can use and all those kinds of things. But the province can do that and municipal governments can do that. And so if you're operating an indoor tobacco production facility in the basement of your residential home or in the closet of your apartment, uh, there's probably a role for the municipal government to play in determining whether or not you're going to engage in that in a safe way. Uh, and that's no different, frankly, for growing um, tobacco or I would say cannabis or operating like a welding shop in your home. If you're going to rewire your electricity, well, there are building bylaws and building codes and those kinds of things that require you to uh, do that in an appropriate and safe manner. And so who are you talking to about the issues that concern you when it comes to uh, cannabis and a post-prohibition uh, regulatory environment. Dana mentioned uh, Sensible BC, and that is one of the things that we really had to grapple with when we're, when we're coming up with the idea of running a provincial initiative campaign. We have the absolute luxury in British Columbia of being the only province that can actually even do uh, uh, legislation by initiative. And so we're sitting down thinking, well, what is it exactly that we could achieve? You clearly can't legalize cannabis at a provincial level. Uh, it's not within the jurisdiction of the province to do that. What can you do? And we, we sort of did a bunch of looking around and a bunch of talking and going back and forth. And we went back and forth with Elections BC quite a bit. Uh, and the upshot was, well, provinces have the power to regulate policing uh, in their province, and they have the power to regulate funding and resource allocation to policing. And so if you've read the Sensible Policing Act, you see that what we're trying to do in that is affect the provincial purse what are, what are uh, police officers in British Columbia allowed to spend money on, including their, their time and, and those resources, those personal resources? And we thought that that was essentially as far as we could go at a provincial level to effectuate change. But it, it does highlight that you know, there is more to the puzzle of how we get to legalization than simply making it no longer a criminal offense. There has to be some kind of uh, some kind of option, right? some kind of regulatory option to take its place. And, and how we get there is interesting. Mason uh, had a lot of remarks uh, earlier uh, today about the experience in Colorado. I think they, they were well taken. I'm wearing a, a shirt I picked up in Washington uh, the, the night that uh, marijuana was legalized, same day uh, in Colorado uh, that it was legalized in Washington. At least that was the day of the vote. Uh, and those two um, campaigns, I think, give us a, a pretty interesting and stark um, look at two different paradigms of how uh, the people involved went about achieving the ultimate goal of legalization. Washington appeared to be, from the outside, um, sort of a big tent, big coalition, and we were talking about this a bit with Mason last night, a, a big tent, a big coalition, a lot of policymakers involved, a lot of buy-in, very little hostility from existing influence makers, uh, very focused, again, from the outside on a, on a regulatory piece, on a, uh, we need to take control and, uh, and, and top down the approach. Whereas Colorado uh, seemed to focus much more on simply having a communication and dialogue with voters about the fact that it was ludicrous that we absolutely prohibit cannabis when we glorify, promote, and, and advertise the heck out of alcohol, a much more dangerous substance. Uh, and we allow that to happen on a for-profit basis. And so those two approaches, I think, led to some different uh, results. And of course, probably far too early to tell uh, the tale of either jurisdiction, um, but there are definitely some differences between the two regulatory schemes. Uh, and I won't get into much of the detail of that. I don't think I have time and I don't think it's it's maybe part of today's presentation, but one example would be in Colorado, you're entitled to produce for yourself on a limited basis. In Washington, you're not. That's absolutely prohibited uh, on the recreational system. That's a pretty big distinction. Um, and that's something that, you know, it's important to talk about. And I think we'll have probably an opportunity to talk about some of these more uh, uh, perhaps controversial topics in the post-prohibition legal, legal environment. 
uh, today on the panel or later. Um, but you know, the, the, the approach that you take and where you're aiming uh, your dialogue is going to be important to uh, the outcome. If you're, if you're thinking about if what concerns you are mostly issues that really should be directed at the provincial government, well, then that's where you need to be spending your time and your focus. Uh, Sensible BC is going to be uh, focusing uh, on municipal elections. Uh, obviously, they're coming up uh, next month. That's important. Uh, we need to get local government to understand some of the realities about cannabis prohibition, cannabis generally, and then move on, hopefully next year, and help influence federal politics so that we can have a government in place in this country that can take that simple technical step uh, of ending cannabis prohibition, but is also prepared to put the next model in place. Uh, and, and, it, and it's a model that will work, uh, and hopefully one that we can have some influence in crafting, and everyone in this room can have some influence in crafting, as long as they keep that dialogue going. So with those thoughts, I'm going to pass the mic uh, over to Mark Hayden, who is uh, going to share some of his opinions. Thank you. Well, thanks. I'll listen to this Thanks, Kurt. Very interesting. Uh, next up, we have Mark Hayden. As you can see, he's an adjunct professor at the UBC School of Population and Public Health. Didn't have to memorize that. Um, and uh, he's uh, done many talks on this subject and led many dialogues on the questions around legalization and, and models for legalization and what that means. And uh, you can tell he's done it before because he's got a PowerPoint presentation all set up for us. I'll let him do, uh, do his talk. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. This is not a new discussion, so I'd like to start by just reflecting on history a little bit. I would suggest it started during the Summer of Love, 1969, when Life magazine said at least 12 million Americans have tried it. Are the penalties too severe? Should it be legalized? Yes. Hey, challenges from the panel already, already, already. We've just started. McLean's magazine, Reefer Madness, the sequel. Men die for it, women cry for it, Ottawa debates it. Newsweek, the battle of marijuana, is it medicine and the risks of legalization? Cannabis Health, the first issue of Cannabis Health with Philip Lucas on the front cover. I like The Economist. I actually really like The Economist. The Economist has been arguing for legalization of currently illegal drugs for decades. This particular issue of The Economist, I don't think they've ever done what they did in this issue before or after, is they devoted most of an issue to one topic, which is the case for legalizing drugs. Libby Davis is demanding an investigation in cannabis health. Larry Campbell has been speaking openly about this, and hey, guess who's on this one? The National Review going to pot. The growing movement toward ending America's irrational marijuana prohibition in July 2004. 2010, the United States of Amerijuana. Again, The Economist, How to Stop the Drug Wars, 2009. The Nation, Dare to End the War on Drugs, 2010. Uh, in addition to the National Post, which is looking at the size of BC's BC bud industry, um, and concluding that it was larger than mining, forestry, and fishing. A significant statement. We have the LEAP folks, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Steve, where are you? He had to go. We had a LEAP member here. But um, the police getting together and arguing for change is a very, very important voice. One of the significant voices happened with the Global Commission. The Global Commission is a group of leading intellectuals and academics and politicians, specifically the former Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, the former presidents of Colombia, Mexico, and Brazil, the former Prime Minister of Greece, the former US Secretary of State, and many other world leading intellectuals made a statement initially with this document. And the first sentence on this document is the war on drugs has failed. And it just builds from there. And they can keep producing reports. One came out very recently, a few months ago, actually last month, taking control, pathways to drug policies that work. And they're starting to delineate, instead of the harms of prohibition, actually alternative models and how it could work. As you may know, the mayors of the province of the UBCM looked at the issue of cannabis prohibition and they decided that they, they took a vote and they decided cannabis should be legalized. That's a statement from the mayors of the province of British Columbia. 
Four former BC attorney generals have added their voice to this group, and they have also said cannabis should be legalized. I'm a parent, and I'm a concerned parent, and I want to create a safe and healthy community for my children. And so it is absolutely fascinating to watch the parent voice speak. Here is a, here's a report coming out of Australia. The prohibition of illicit drugs is killing and criminalizing our children, and we're all letting it happen. So I think concerned parents who don't want their children to be involved in the criminal justice system and are acutely aware of the harms that that does is a very important voice for change. If I had just one slide to show you, it would be this slide here. So I work with the Health Officer Council of British Columbia. It is the voice of public health in the province of British Columbia, and we write position papers. In fact, we've been writing position papers for years. And we started by offering concerns about the process of drug prohibition. And more recently, what we've been doing is coming up with alternative models. Myself, personally, what I do is I publish papers on different drugs, and I say, if you wanted to legalize crack cocaine, what would it look like? What is a regulated market for it, using public health principles for cocaine? My most recent paper was looking at cannabis. But if I had one slide to show you, this would be it, because this essentially summarizes the position of the public health officers of British Columbia. On one end of this U-curve, what we have is drug prohibition. And drug prohibition maximizes health and social harms to your community. It engages youth in a certain way. It produces bullets, and bullets are, quite frankly, a public health problem. So you have a system that is run by illegal market gangsters. On the other end, you have a system that is run by corporate profit, where the agenda of company, companies like Coca-Cola, like Nike, and Blue Jeans is essentially to maximize profit, and that is what they do. And they will always do what they can do to sell a product and to increase consumption. So the other end, which is legalizing with few restrictions, is also a problem. The solution, according to myself and the Health Officers Council of this province, is a public health approach to the regulation and control of, quite frankly, all currently illegal drugs. Here we're to talk about cannabis, but I'm really interested in the whole picture. I really think that all currently illegal drugs need to be discussed. So I've talked, I'm going to talk a lot tomorrow what that actually looks like. But I'd, most people have focused on the concerns of prohibition. I think we're all pretty aware of the damage that it does to our health and our society. So I'd like to talk about the end. I'd like to talk about how we need to learn the lessons from alcohol and tobacco. Because if we don't learn those lessons as we walk forward into this new paradigm of hopefully having legalized cannabis, um, we'll be making a huge mistake. So I'd like to show you some images. your ticket to a world of sophistication and style. And she is smoking a drug that when used as directed will kill you. Here we have muscular young rock climbers with kayaks on their backs in the middle of winter with no wetsuits on. And they are promoting a drug that when used as directed will create significant throat cancers, mouth cancers, disfiguring problems for cancer is actually a very nasty experience. I assume that everybody in this room knows what 420 means. Okay, we've got it covered. Craft Berry Beer Company claims that it was four ingredients in 20 days and that it had nothing to do with cannabis. I think they're lying. I think this is cross marketing. I think this is taking one drug it's using group and marketing a product, another drug product to them. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm completely wrong. Maybe they had no idea what the term 420 meant. They wouldn't Just put a maybe. clock on it then, right? I mean, yes. the clock is clearly... Yeah. Yes. Just saying. Yes. <laughs> so let's look at some other examples of cross-marketing. Now, I don't know what you see in this image, but I see a line of white powder. Now, to be honest, Somebody looked at this image when I was doing a presentation, and they said, not just a line of white powder, but two nostrils. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I didn't see that at first. But I believe this is cross-marketing. I think this is basically <laughs> taking one drug-using group and marketing another drug to them. How about this one? Virtual Ecstasy, which is sold in Alberta liquor stores, and it contains rum, triple second Sambuca. I think this is cross-marketing. 
So what do we have here? Let me describe to you what I see. I see a very sexy body, dominant and in control. And she is consuming a drug that when, as Shakespeare said, it increases the desire, but decreases the performance. <laughs> right. <laughs> And why would, why would you settle for just one sexy body when you can ask the question, why have just one? <laughs> Polygamy Porter is sold in Utah. Again, BC Bud is a logoized product. This van was parked in front of my house recently. Here's more cross marketing. You know, this one is actually completely transparent. You know, it is Connect, a liquid sedative drug, popularly known as alcohol or beer, with, um, with uh, a grow up. I want to show you a train wreck that actually happened. In each one of these 23, this is an American product, in each one of these 23 ounce cans. There is the equivalent of, and the first of all, let's look at the look of these. They are designed to look like candy mints, and the, the look and the flavor of them is attractive to kids. They're candy flavored drinks. In each one of these 23 ounce cans, there is the equivalent of four beer, three cups of coffee, and 60 grams of sugar. If you drink two of these things, you've had the equivalent of eight beer, six cups of coffee, and 120 grams of sugar. Eventually, they got shut down, eventually, but they fought it tooth and nail. This is a public health disaster in the making. So really what I have just shown you is complete illusions. The, these illusions have an objective, and the objective is to increase consumption of the drugs that have been shown here. We need to learn that lesson if we're going to go into the world of regulating cannabis. Details tomorrow. <laughs> But I would like to position myself. I teach at the EBC School of Population and Public Health and lots of other places. And so, but I write papers and I write papers from the view of public health. How would public health participate in this? So public health is the study of the reciprocal relationship between three factors, the host, the agent, and the environment. And in this case, the host is the drug user, the agent is the drug, and the environment are the laws, the policies, the social attitudes that exist in our society about drugs. When I first designed this slide, the professor that I work with said, you've got it all wrong, Mark, because I had all three pink boxes the same size. And what she said was, you must make that box bigger, because if we have limited tax resources to try and make a healthier society, we have to shift how we spend money, and this is where you'll get the biggest bang for the buck. If we can figure out different social attitudes, our prohibitionist attitudes to drugs create significant health and social harms for all of us. And we need to do it differently. And we need to figure out a language that we can take publicly and sell it to the dominant population of the world as being an attractive process that will protect our children in a better way. The language used by the public health is the social determinants of health. So what factors in our society create what health outcomes? How we think about drugs, and dominantly we think about drugs through the lens of prohibition. How we think about drugs in our society causes us harm. And we need to figure out a different language in order to challenge that. Now, I'm just going to throw a couple of ideas on the table about regulation. So, if there's one lesson to be learned from tobacco, if there's one lesson, if you allow a product to be branded, it will be advertised. So it is not about preventing advertising of a product, it's about preventing branding.
advertising has a completely the reverse effect. So that's briefly what a public health approach to cannabis regulation would look like. More details, many more details tomorrow. One does not discover new lands without consenting to lose sight of the shore for a long time. The saddest aspect of life now is that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. Over to Mark Emery. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. That was interesting. Looking, looking over the different uh, ideas there and what we'd be moving forward. I'd be curious if we were to legalize and have those restrictions on marijuana but not on alcohol, that that would create a situation where alcohol, which is the more harmful one, is being promoted and advertised, whereas marijuana is sold in a non-branded, discreet, you know, that may not be the situation we want either, but that could be the whole. But anyways, that's, that was an interesting talk. Thank you very much. Uh, next we have Mark Emery. I don't know if he needs a lot of introduction, but some call him the Prince of Pot. I'm happy to call him my friend. And uh, he's fresh out of prison, fresh off a European tour. And uh, he's here now to talk about what he thinks legalization should look like. Thanks, Tony. Well... We have a really great opportunity in Canada that we've never had in our lifetime, and that's we have an election coming up which can determine the future of this movement, the future of cannabis in Canada. And that's next year's federal election, which I'm promoting and will be promoting as Legalization Day next year. Because, you know, Justin Trudeau and the federal Liberal Party have embraced legalization. It's very clearly part of their platform. It's on their website. They don't hesitate to talk about it. It's going to be the number one in really only substantial election issue next year. Be assured of that. I'm going to make it that myself, but failing that, there are no other distinguishing things aside from personality between the three leaders. Their policies vary very little difference between any particular subject except marijuana. And it's the one that's going to stick in people's mind. So when we talk about legalization, we're talking about something that could happen in a very <coughs> near future. It's all direction, all liberty is directional. We never get freedom all at once and 100% and we never have to work for it again. It's something that keeps going on and on until we die, until the next generation comes. We're always fighting for a freedom that we never fully attain. So I'm willing to compromise in many, many ways as long as no one goes to jail or gets punished for anything to do with marijuana and people have the right to grow their own. Everything else, well, you can zone it this area and you can regulate. And you, uh, My expectation is that the federal government will cede control to the provinces because that makes most sense. Withdraw it from the schedule. And we need a moratorium, by the way. If the Liberals get a majority in the next election on October 19th, Legalization Day, 2015, then we need a moratorium immediately, because what's the point of charging everybody or anybody if you're going to legalize it in six to eight months? It just means everybody's lawyers will stall going to court until the final regime is brought in. So... If they're any good, of course. Now, there are a lot of things I do think we need in a legal regime. I think we absolutely need to advertise. And the reason we need to advertise is not to sell marijuana to the existing market, but to get people off alcohol and tobacco and prescription drugs. We need to aggressively campaign as an industry and as individual brands why every other choice is a bad one except ours. Right? And we need to make that message the number one message of the new millennia that starts after we legalize pot. The rest of you are killing yourselves. Why not join our crew, our club, our brand, our lifestyle, and join us and live longer, live healthier, and live happier? Absolutely, we've got to advertise. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And uh, again, there'll be many opportunities in the future for civil disobedience, and we'll prove that that's going to be the case one way or another. You know, And the other thing is, is we need to be able to I see, I don't even accept that we need any regulation. I think if cannabis were simply legalized tomorrow with absolutely no regulation, we'd all be fine. The public would be fine. The public safety would be fine. Everything would be improved vastly. We'd have huge amounts of R&D going into cannabis. We don't need any regulation. But one thing, I will tolerate some regulation, and you probably should tolerate it too, because again, all directory, all liberty is directional. But we need to be able to 
not be punitively taxed. Like this business in Washington State where it's 25%. Excuse me, everything you people do who are passing these rules is more dangerous than anything I do. Okay, smoking pot is not a sin. It's not a weakness. It's not a moral failing. We don't need to be punished like the tobacco people because we don't fill your hospitals up. We don't need to be punished like the alcohol people because we're not a social menace and a danger on the road that requires 10,000 cops across Canada every Friday night to police and monitor your bad behavior because you drink alcohol. We're not those people. You don't need to tax us. We'll pay PST and GST and then can fuck off. Do not take any more money. Yeah. We've been punished for our lifestyle for 45 years by prohibition. I'm not going to tolerate in a legal environment a continued stigmatization and punishment when you're making money off our back. You know, so there's, there's to be none of that in the long run. In the short run, we'll take whatever we can get, and that's the way politics is. And essentially, that sums up my whole attitude to it. We need to really get together behind the liberal candidates across Canada. I think it's intolerable to hear anybody speaking differently. It just doesn't make any sense. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. No major leader of a Canadian political party that has a chance to form the next government has ever promised full legalization and expunging everyone's criminal record. Come on. That's my dream platform. That's my dream opportunity. And the one thing we need that no one's promising, we need an apology from all the people who advocated a form of prohibition that punished us. But again, let's stop people going to jail first. Let's stop being punished as a, you know, uh, by prohibition for who we are by paying these outrageous prices for marijuana. You'll know when you're living in a legal environment because you should be paying 10 to $20 an ounce, notwithstanding all the people that want to regulate or tax it. But really, Marijuana to grow is no more challenging or difficult to grow well than growing good tomatoes. And they are not that expensive. And that's what a legal environment in tomatoes looks like. And that's what we should have, too. So, yeah. Well, thanks, Mark. Appreciate that. It's good to have some different perspectives. And I, and I would agree with the directional aspect of things that it's absolutely, you know, it's going to be a long time. They're still apologizing now for things they did to like Chinese and stuff like, you know, generations ago, right? So we could be a long wait till we get the apology to the marijuana culture. It might be our kids that get it on our behalf, but, uh, but it's going to come one day. I, I do believe that as well. Um, our final uh, panelist is uh, Adam Olson. He's the current leader of the BC Green Party, and he's a long-term uh, city councillor in Saanich, right? So, yeah, Central Saanich. And uh, the Green Party has had policy of legalization of marijuana for a very long time, uh, and uh, he's going to talk to us about what his vision of legalization would include. Welcome, Adam. Hide squail chill, ail at CM nights, jail at chah, the hun up to nesane, just a layer seneth husayanich, lay it with all the lungs. Hi, my name is the hun up, my co, uh, it's my co Salish name. I'm from the Sartlip village in uh, the Husayanich territory on the Sanish Peninsula. My name's Adam Olson, and uh, as I was in, as Dan introduced me, I'm the current leader of the BC Green Party and have been for since August. I'm, I'm glad that. Um, that Mark actually put the caveat in there that uh, that the federal liberals are not the only party that has had very clear and distinct um, policy around marijuana. Um, the BC Green Party also shares very clear and distinct policy uh, for a long time, much along uh, along the lines of the other Mark on the board, Mark Hayden, who talks about it in terms of uh, public health um, uh, perspective. Uh, I guess you know we've got Kirk on the on the far end, who is the legal expert. Uh, Mark the Mark Hayden, the academic expert. We've got Mark here, who's the social expert. Everybody knows that. And I, I guess I represent the political expertise on the board, although I'm not much of a political expert. What I would say is I was the only politician that accepted your invitation. And. So, so while I respect the work that Mr. Emery is doing, I would say that um, had that will been so solid, perhaps we would have other political expertise on this board as well. And I think that we need to continue uh, to push for a, a uh, more pragmatic approach towards our relationship with um, substances, uh, a, a better approach towards uh, our approach towards substances. Um, 
I'm, I'm actually disappointed, Dana, that neither the, the, neither the Green parties, the, the federal nor the provincial Green Party, appear on Sensible BC's website as having progressive. Uh, the other parties do appear there. So I, I would say that we do have progressive policies. We look at it in, a, in, a, uh, in the broad context. Substance use is uh, viewed in our, in our Green Book 2013 as a, as a public health concern, not a, and, and not necessarily a concern, a public health matter, uh, not a criminal matter. Uh, we focus on harm reduction in the Green Book uh, rather than criminalizing substance use, and, not, and especially cannabis, but not just cannabis. Um, we believe in the end of prohibition of, illegal, of the currently illegal substances, um, and slightly different than my friend here, Mark, <laughs> uh, regulation and control of their production, manufacture and distribution and sale, and control and taxation of the substance like we do uh, tobacco and alcohol. So I, I, I see where um, Mark wants to go with this, and I appreciate that. I think that there are uh, steps to, to getting towards, um, to getting there. So this morning as I'm uh, getting ready to take my, my kid to soccer, well, before, before soccer, I woke up early and was doing some research around this. And having read the experience, having read some of the experience that we see down in in Colorado and in Washington State, I wonder really what are we doing? Uh, when I travel the province and I and I talk to uh, specifically, I talk to one mayor from um, Southern British Columbia. He, he lets me know that in fact um, their economy it lives and dies by marijuana production and export. Um, and so we pretend, I guess, that there is no economic implications to this, but yet. When I have a mayor telling me that there are deep economic implications to his community based on the trade of marijuana, um, we're just lying to ourselves. That's all. Um, we're pretending like prohibition of marijuana actually has an, Im an impact. Um, down in, in the states that have legalized it, they said that you, you, know, you can only sell it a certain distance away from schools. Well, currently you can buy it at schools. So, you know, I, in fact, that's probably the place to go get it if you're looking for some. Uh, I went to school with a kid um, who now is one of the most successful business people that I know. And his uncle was uh, sold marijuana and he learned business. He learned business. He's part of the economy. Now he's, part, now he's a very important part of the economy. His businesses are very successful. So we need to stop lying to ourselves that this idea of pro prohibiting the, the use and the, the growth and, and the sale of marijuana is actually having an, an impact. And from somebody who looks at it from a, from a public policy perspective, and I'm in politics, I do look at the opportunities that it presents ourselves, it presents our province. Uh, opportunities that are being realized right to the neighbor, our neighbors to the south. Um, the economic opportunities. And it doesn't have to be punitive taxes, as, as Mark highlighted. It's just um, the, the production and taxation of it would increase revenues. And, and for a government, we have a liberal government who talks all about the economy. It's, one, it's, it's no wonder why they haven't already um, legalized probably the most uh, lucrative renewable resource. And we talk about renewable resources in this province. There's a pretty quick turnaround I, from, from what I hear. So. Um, nonetheless, I think that uh, it presents an opportunity to the province of British Columbia. I'm sad that my colleagues from the other parties are not here having a real discussion about this. They would prefer to, I guess, stick around in their uh, ideological positions, um, and I think that that's what it is at, at its worst. I look forward to engaging it. I'm, I'm not the, the policy expert here, but I can tell you that if the Green Party, or when, not if, when the Green Party forms government in this province, and it will be much sooner than I think a lot of you uh, think right now, um, when we do, we will have a real discussion about this because I think that um, perhaps the Liberal Party of Canada will get there first, but if not, we'll be right there having a real discussion about this because um, frankly I'm embarrassed that the majority of British Columbians, the majority of Canadians uh, 25 years ago thought that we should reform our, our, our approach uh, to marijuana and cannabis, and I think it's it's somewhat embarrassing that uh, our politicians continue to drag around uh, in this and and not make real change. So I look forward to your questions and to the discussion, and um, I in invite you to uh, to have a chat with me after when this is over. Thank you. Thanks, Adam.
Well, we're gonna. Thanks, Adam. And uh, so we got a while. We got if people have questions for our panelists or, or ideas they want to put forward about what legalization means. I figured David Malmo Levine would have his hand up first. And uh, okay, no long speeches, but uh, yeah, you want the need the mic here? I'll give you that. Uh, it makes me sound less angry if I have a microphone. In yeah. All right. Because I don't have to yell. Um, this is uh, for the um, Green Party uh, leader. Uh, the problem we have with uh, various proposals for legalization is that sometimes there's no buy-in for the growers who have supported the movement all this time, who bought the seeds that uh, helped create the Prince of Pot. And um, they had things like uh, the Proposition 19 in California really didn't offer 95% of the growers any value. And so the problem I have with the liberals is they say they want legalization, but they're very fuzzy about the details. And here's a great opportunity to steal votes from the liberals is to come up with a detailed, inclusive model of legalization that protects growers who uh, don't have a lot of money and, and, and would like to um, participate in the economy, but there'd be economic barriers to access, such as in the LP process, or growers who have criminal records but would like to participate in the process. Um, what sort of model of legalization can you articulate right now, and can, can you articulate an inclusive model that protects our entire community? Thanks, Dave. There you go. Um, I'm not going to articulate any model, to be honest with you. Um, certainly there is a federal discussion that, that has to happen here. I'm a provincial politician. I don't know enough about the, I mean, we've, we've had a, a very, very brief legal review. We have, uh, like I said, the academic, the social. I think that part of developing a, a policy would be to acknowledge the things that you're talking about. And where we're at as a party right now is we're, we're, we're not there yet. So I'm not going to articulate anything. I'm not going to make any statements here that, that I'm not going to go out in front on this one. But what I will say is that we have longstanding policies within our party uh, that give us this direction. And that's the direction that we'll take. And so you highlight, and, and if we have an inclusive policy process, which, which we do, those are things that we're going to uh, take into consideration. So though we, I think we need to learn from the experiences of those who've gone out uh, ahead of our province and the country on this. And um, if those are the experiences that we're finding in other jurisdictions, hopefully we learn from those and that we incorporate them. So I'm not going to say, oh, yeah, this is what we're going to do. What I'll say is that we'll have an inclusive process and those will be considered. You can't get everything you want at once. There's just no way. Like when they passed Proposition 215 in California in 1996, it gave protection to people who needed it for medical reasons. But... 20 years later, we still haven't advanced much beyond that, but it's not to say that we shouldn't have passed Proposition 215 because it wasn't completely everything we wanted. And same with the decriminalization in Portugal. I just got back from touring universities in the British Isles in Ireland, and I was with a fellow named Dr. Jao Gulao, who's the person who decriminalized all the dr all drugs in Portugal in 2001, and they still have this policy. And he was articulating how it's made life so much better for all the addicts of hard drugs, as well as people who smoke cannabis, because they can carry around fairly generous quantities and not really find themselves in any criminal problems whatsoever, and it helps them stabilize, stabilize their lives. It's not perfect, though, but it's really been great for a lot of them. They've even reduced addiction by half in the 15 years but it's still not everything. It's still not. There's still no legal producers of these drugs. They're still not being sold legally. People who are producing them aren't paying taxes. There's still, in fact, the cartels and gangs that operate in prohibition that supply all these people who are allowed to possess so much for decriminalization. And so it goes. All the medical marijuana policies in the United States and Washington State's legalization is somewhat flawed, but it's better than what they had before. So the idea that we should oppose things because they're not perfect, which is what David is always saying. That's not what I'm saying, Mark. I'm saying that the monopoly problems are harder to solve than the non-monopoly problems. The monopoly imperfections are harder to remove than the non-monopoly imperfections. You look at every other economy that experienced a monopoly, that's been the case. Look at oil, look at technology, look at uh, pharma. Yeah. But... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, 
No, look, look, though, the, 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 the fact I sat on a, on a municipal council and we have to we have to understand here that there are a hundred different opinions in this room. OK, there are, I always used to say as a municipal councillor that there's 16,000 differences of opinion that I've got to represent in this. And so there's a negotiation process that has to be respected here and that has to be worked through. And, and as a politician, that's the job that I challenge Andrew Weaver with in, in negotiating that negotiation that has to happen in government. I just want to throw a thought out there from a public health perspective. So the question is how to regulate cannabis. And the issue of growing your own has come up a number of times here. So I'd, I'd like to throw, throw some thoughts at that particular one. Um, there's a book out there called The Spirit Level, written by a fellow named Wilkinson. And he makes it an absolute, it's public health for anybody. It's a beautiful book to read. And he makes a very simple argument that he makes persuasively for the whole book. And what he says is most health and social problems in all societies across the globe, and it doesn't really matter what, be it low birth weight babies, to teenage pregnancies, to murder rates, to suicide rates, to addiction rates in your society, it doesn't really matter what. The, the most significant predictor of that in a community is inegalitarianism. It's about difference between the wealth of the rich and the wealth of the poor. It's the split. It's not the, not the, overall, the, the overall wealth of a country. It's how, what, how much difference there is between the rich of a society and the poor of a society. So the more incomes are split, the more wealth is concentrated at the upper end of the echelon, the more problems a society faces. So if we take that, that's public health analysis. If we take that and we say, okay, how does that apply to cannabis? Well, you don't want concentrations of wealth. What you want to do is you want to spread the wealth around. And the more you can spread the wealth around, the healthier your society will be. So then instead of what Harper's doing right now is producing very large concentrated big growers, what you actually want to do is you want to have lots of very small growers. So you're not, you don't. So you don't just want people growing their own, but you actually want people growing their own and growing in very small volumes and kind of working with spreading the money around in a very egalitarian way. And there's a very strong public health argument for that. I agree. <laughs> Thanks for your question, Dave. Hope that helped deal with that. Anyone that just one in the back right there? I just wanted to talk to the renewable resource of it. I, I've been living off grid for 10 years and struggling uh, to find products that I can buy, that I can spend my money on, that are renewable and safe for the environment and all of these things. And I wonder why, as campa campaigners, uh, I mean, I understand completely why you would focus on medical marijuana, but the industry, the, ec the economy of it is huge. The product produ production, and we're, we're pitting alcohol against um, marijuana, but why are we not making partnerships with other industries that are going to benefit economically from using this product? in all of its capacities, not only medicine, not only rec recreationally, but in oil production and, and renewable sources of, of self-sufficiency for the little guy, which is going to continue to spread that, that um, wealth out instead of funneling it up to the top. So I just believe that the discussion just is not broad enough when, uh, when you can get other industries that would be benefit that would benefit in the R and D of of hemp's uses yeah, that isn't only um, getting the public to accept it as medicine, but it as actually the savior to our economy that it actually could be. Well, more than just the economy, but so many well, uses. Well, that's that's a good yeah. question, and you know the liberals legalized hemp in Canada in 1996. But the rules haven't really changed much since then, and it's very over-regulated. They've got to do a lot of paperwork. They have to reapply. It's like the medical marijuana patients. They've got to reapply every single year. They have to, and if their crop happens to be a little bit high in THC, the whole thing gets destroyed. They would lose their, their crop and their potential livelihood. And, you know, when they first legalized hemp, the big problem was that everyone was worried they were going to grow marijuana in the hemp fields, which, as we know, is the worst place to grow a marijuana crop. But... Since then, it, not a single, that's never happened once. And certainly it's time, 18 years later now, to maybe 
loosen up our hemp rules a little bit and allow that more. I just and, uh, that. But the reason they probably talk about you know recreational marijuana and medical marijuana and that more than the hemp is partly because hemp is legalized, although it's a lot smaller than it should be and it's too tightly restricted. And what's keeping hemp restricted is the fear of the THC. Some American states have passed laws where you can just use the CBD medicine, but the THC medicine, ooh, that's not allowed, and this really big fear. And so, you know, if marijuana was fully legalized, then I think that the hemp industry would then be fully liberated. And if I'm right in Colorado, you're growing hemp there now for the first time, right? And that came about, I mean, you, your initiative wasn't talking about the benefits of hemp compared to alcohol or whatever. You didn't really, I didn't really even know it was legalizing hemp. When it, when it happened, I just knew it was about marijuana, but then afterwards it turned out that Colorado was growing all this hemp all of a sudden. I'm looking at Mason because he's well, from Colorado, and if you want to ask him any questions about uh, whether, uh, whether that are relevant to the panel, you can as well. But yeah. certainly legalizing marijuana would solve all those hemp problems, but you're right that maybe we should bring that up more. But I'll let Adam want to speak to that. Well. I, I don't know if I entirely agree that it solves all the hemp problems because they're big oil. And you, you, mentioned, the, you mentioned the little guy. The governments right now are looking out for big guys. And so the, the, re, the reality about hemp is a fiber, um, very, very strong fiber, and used, my culture used it. Um, I saw a net that was made in the late 1700s out of Indian hemp uh, down in the Colorado, uh, basement of the Colorado Field Museum, or a uh, Chicago Field Museum. Um, so we've been processing and using hemp as a fiber because of its strength. Uh, it can produce and make oil and, and, and other fuels out of it. So um, I think that I just want to make the point that I think that we've been looking out for the big guy and not the little guy. And uh, that's part of what the that's part of why we're sitting here on this panel today, I think. I actually just added that also when they legalized hemp, one of the rules they made was you couldn't grow less than 10 hectares at a time. And that was entirely to cut out the little guy. They didn't want to be regulating backyard hemp <coughs> crops and lower, you know, people who weren't necessarily big farmers growing it. And I would certainly, you know, think everybody should be able to grow hemp or marijuana, but certainly low THC marijuana or hemp, it's not threatening anybody whether they're afraid of THC or not. And that's what we should be working towards. My vision for full legalization in the long run is when our farmers can grow high THC marijuana by the 100 acre lot. And that, I think, is what, you know, the final, that to me is when it's fully legalized, when farmers can grow it, when it's that available. But we're, we're a long way from getting to that point, I think. It's going to be quite, quite like, tightly controlled for a while. Yes, Anne? Um, I just wanted to um, say something. I hear often people think that um, it's a good idea just to make it a ticketable offense. And uh, I work with drug users downtown, and there's just this massive, I mean, we wish we could get on with talking about uh, the situation with the drug users, but we haven't been able to because the way the police have now moved forward, they're just ticketing poor people who also might happen to be addicts. We, we haven't, you know what I mean? So I just wanted to say, I don't know if, what, if other people are warning about this, but I want to warn everyone, just say no to ticketable events for marijuana. It will just jail the poor, the poorest yeah. people, the Aboriginal yeah. people, the, you know, anyone that they can get, yeah. because police get overtime for tickets, and it keeps the police extremely busy um, and involved and then politically involved and all that. I mean, we're not making much comment about the people that are really holding a lot of this back. But I just, it's, it's seductive. You think, oh yeah, just the ticket. It's just a bylaw ticket. Yeah. Just say, and, and so I just wanted to well, what, the, what are these tickets on. for? Possession. Me? Possession. possession. These tickets are for possession? Yeah. If, the yeah. police are proposing uh, well, using tickets right now. now. But, but the, so those are different from a citation under the Contraventions Act. And what are they being ticketed for now? Right now they're being ticketed for, right so they're they're for jaywalking, yeah. uh, littering, um, and vending. But that's not comparable, though. It is possible. I'm just saying any excuse? poor person who gets a ticket, the ticket is a massive amount of money. Yeah. So you get about $200 when you're on welfare, yeah. and the tickets are $200. So people have never paid them. And if you wait long enough, it probably takes 18 months. Then it'll work its way through the court system to the point where you're subpoenaed to court, you don't show up at that court date, and now when you're picked up, you're, you can be held in remand yeah. for a ticket for jaywalking or bending. And it's, yeah. it's yeah. called yeah. mining the poor yeah. for crime. It's a uh, it's yeah. huge in the state. Like Part when of this Ferguson thing came up, they started saying there was 33,000 um, you know, warrants in a, a population of 22,000 people. Well, well, that means they're targeting people, and that's, you know, for jaywalking, yeah. and your, your taillights out. For there's a lot of driving, because everyone's very suburban and driving a lot, and you, you just can't function without a car. But I'm just saying, 
Um, I, I know it's a seductive thing that comes up, and I just wanted to make that comment and let someone knows more than me where there's some fabulous place where they ticket people for marijuana and it's really working out for the poor. Because I, I just want to warn people about tickets. They sound so innocent, but they're really, really um, destructive. And they really jail poor people. Like if you're marijuana and you're poor, you're in jail. And the rest well, of us are just going, oh, I can pop up that line. The amount of money that can be made off of... Uh, off of uh, Taxing, regulating and taxing marijuana is just one aspect of the economic uh, piece of the pie. The other part of it is the savings, you know, in in, re, in in repurposing police to something else and repurposing the criminal. And, and in fact, the lawyer probably can speak about that better than I can. But the reality of this is, is that we we don't talk about the money that's spent, you know, on on chasing people around. I've got to disagree with you. The, the Contraventions Act is the act by which we would be fined for marijuana, which is a criminal offense, unlike jaywalking and these other things you said, which are provincially statutory offenses. You can go to jail if you don't pay them, but here's the, the thing with the $100 fine proposal the conservatives are floating around under the Contraventions Act is that they'd be very easy to thwart. Uh, because here's the problem. They give you a ticket and then they walk away. You go to the judge and say, that wasn't marijuana, Your Honor. And they're not going to test it. They're not going to be able to prove. If you go to court, the judge will have to agree with you because the police are never going to test your marijuana for a $100 citation. And ultimately, you can just challenge it, and they can't prove it was marijuana. So they won't be effective. And, and But here's the other thing. You're not comparing, comparing the difference. 25 to 30,000 people in Canada get criminal records every year by being criminally charged and convicted. Well, that disappears. You've got 25,000 people who can go to the United States, who can get bonded, who can work in jobs in exchange for X amount of people who get a $100 fine who just don't want to pay it. I, to me, it's... David, it's... A, I'm pointing out that there are huge benefits from eliminating criminal records and criminal convictions and criminal prosecution and criminal arrests with frisking and a variety of other invasive intrusions that don't happen anymore if you get a $100 fine issued to you. And that officer, candidly, he doesn't give a shit if you protest it in court. He's not going to be there. That marijuana is never going to get tested. You won't have to pay that fine because the judge is going to find you not guilty. Well, if you don't show up in court, that's the democratic process by which we live in. If you object to all the most fundamental aspects of Western civilization, you are going to get into trouble. Ticketing is not the solution. And even and even Peter Mc, even Peter McKay recently said, you know, ticketing is not decriminalization. It would mean increased enforcement because a police officer now has to decide between arresting you and going through all the half the hassle of arresting you, they'll probably just take your pot and scold you and then let you go. If they could write a ticket, they could. But Mark's but also right that we could fight those tickets and we would actually as a movement yeah. organize people and tell them, if you get a ticket, call us, we'll help you, we'll make sure, and we would try to clog up the justice system with thousands of tickets, everybody going to fight it. Yeah. But So although it's not the right solution, it's something that if they were proposing tickets, I might support that in a way, but only because we could fight that easier than what we got now. Yeah, you know? but, how many, how many but I got mean, convicted in the last year for pot across Canada? That wouldn't exist. Although they, while they, they, the proposal they want to make is they could ticket you or they could still arrest you if they want to. That's what they're saying. They want to add ticketing to their list. So I don't know if tickets would replace the current arrests, but they would add to that with a bunch of people getting fines as well. If the tickets totally replaced arrests... That would be better because then nobody's being arrested right. at all. That'd be more saleable anyway. But Vancouver, combining the both, no one's getting punished right now. I mean, keep doing the same thing everywhere else. I mean, and you could, could, you know, if they want, if somebody was trying to put on a 420 rally in a new town, for instance, the police might not want to arrest everybody, but they could show up and write tickets to everybody and cause. But you know, we could also. It would really depend on the nitty gritty details of what that ticketing worked and under the contraventions act or how there's it was no, there. But there's no good decrim model to point to. There's nowhere you can say, oh, that really improved the situation. But there's well, there's direction. No, yeah, well, it's it's a way of increasing enforcement because it has an incentive to do that enforcement. Yeah. Yeah. Who get police, overtime on every single ticket and if there's something illegal, police love it overtime. Well, yeah. and if, they, if they that money, what, I mean, the police are increasing seizures of homes and properties, and that money goes to the government and ends up a lot of it going back to the police. We don't want them financially motivated. Yeah, right. We'll take your question up right there. I don't understand why sensible BC is going okay first to decriminalize prior to legalize. Right. I, 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 I can stop you right there and answer that question. Yeah. Yeah, so, do you want me to do it? You want to do it? 
Let's do it simultaneously. At Let's, we, we can echo each other. <laughs> Since the BC was focused on what British Columbia can do as a province, British Columbia can't legalize marijuana and open sales unless we separate from Canada and have a constitutional crisis. What British Columbia can do is we can stop arrest for marijuana possession. Any province could do that tomorrow. So our goal with Sensible BC has always been to repeal marijuana prohibition, to legalize so that every Canadian adult can grow their own, can buy it in the store. But our first step provincially was to stop arrest. And if British Columbia said, if the Christy Clark said, we want legalization, we're going to take a step as a province to stop all marijuana arrests, and I'm calling on Stephen Harper to legalize marijuana. That would be huge. That's what our campaign wanted. We didn't get there, but that's what our goal was. But our ultimate goal is to end marijuana prohibition in Canada fully. Uh, decriminalization was only the first step towards that because it was what the province could do and still could do now. Any province could do this immediately. But you the, the concern about ticketing for people. Yeah. No, no, uh, we, we, we didn't call our, our decriminalization was not ticketing. Our, yeah. the, the, those, these words mean different things to different people. That's yeah. part of our discussion. But our decriminalization model was that police would no longer make any searches, seizures, or arrests, or investigations relating to possession of marijuana. So if you're in possession of marijuana, but you're not breaking any other laws, a British Columbia police officer would leave you alone. We didn't advocate for tickets. We wrote very specific legislation, and Kirk wrote it, but that was what our... And it was something that we talked about a lot. People ask me that when you're decrim and legalization, and these words mean a lot of things to different people. But we want to repeal prohibition, starting off with stopping arrest for marijuana possession as a first step. So first and, and all, if, if you do that, then you say, well, if you can have 15 kilos of... Tobacco, you didn't have 15 kilos. That, that wasn't, that's Wait. kind of what we're looking for. Yeah, that wasn't specific in our legislation, but that, that's the idea. Yeah, if it's for possession, personal purposes, any amount would have been allowed. Yeah, in fact, in fact, under uh, the reforms of the Police Act that we proposed in the Sensible BC legislation, uh, police would not be able to detain or write tickets to you either, because what we essentially said is police in British Columbia cannot devote any resources, whether they be personnel resources, time spent, or monetary resources uh, on the enforcement of uh, laws against simple possession on adults. Uh, and so you can't write a ticket in that situation because the ticket book is a resource, the time the officer is spending writing the ticket is a resource, the time they would have to spend in court is a resource. Uh, and so essentially, irrespective of whether some decriminalization scheme comes down the pipe and tickets become an option, which I quite frankly think we're probably beyond uh, in Canadian society right now. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, but if we pass a sensible policing act, it, police in BC won't be issuing any tickets either. Uh, they would be prohibited from doing so. Have you Just, thought of calling it de-punishment instead of decriminalization? Because that's what it really is, and more people would be attracted to it. Not a bad idea. We've only got a few minutes left, so let's try to keep our questions short. We'll go right in the back to you there. Yeah. I just did four months of cultivation and spent time on Vancouver Island. I don't know what Mark saw while he was there, but the damn system is broken. Yeah. 7000 a month to keep me locked up for pot. That, and it's 7000 a year to educate my grandkids. The third day I was in jail, I'm on kitchen detail. I'm told, check the cups. There was just as much dope in jail as there is on the street. <laughs> so it's a total waste of money. Yeah. The third day I'm there, I check the cups coming from segregation. There's an ounce of blow and an ounce of heroin in the cup. Brought in, somebody smuggled, somebody smuggled in their rectum. Okay. And no. And I opened it up. The guy that's cooking tells me, your job is to check these. Now, I'm not going to tell him, screw you. I don't care what they do. They were better with their dope. But it hasn't stopped a damn thing in the jails. It is such a waste of money. The people every day on the street that went on the outside, you know, they brought the cigarettes in for everything. So the whole system is broken. And to let alone penalize me because I gave pot to medical marijuana people that had that were either on social services or on a disability, and I did this for free, and you locked me up for four months let alone spending $50,000 in one day for an eight-man SWAT team, four cops, two dog handlers, and a helicopter for six hours. It's ludicrous. It has to change. It's immoral to begin with. And as a physical financial situation, it, it's the biggest drain that we have. We need either decriminalization or illegalization. I've been in the business 35 years besides owning other logging companies. 
When I immigrated here, my lawyer told me he could keep me in the country as long as I didn't screw Canada revenue. As I've grown <laughs> over the years, I use it and pay tax on it just like I do in my market garden so that they couldn't kick me out of the country. Okay, it's nuts. It's broken. I agree with most of the panel. You know, the gentleman from the UBC that teaches. All drugs, we, we can start with marijuana, but we have to make it. Drugs are, um, they're a social problem, medical problem, not a criminal problem, and it creates gangs that have made Absolutely. billions. Oh, here, 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 here. We have never, we have never seen they need to make the law so they can pay Kirk. Yeah, yeah, I know, but we have never killed more people in our streets with gang wars since prohibition in the United States. Yeah. Okay, Absolutely. it's foolish. And, and, and the bystanders that are happening. Mark, well, I, we, what you, you saw in a federal jail in the United States, but it, it gets in there. The people that want to even in jail, have it. Yeah, it's really, it's really a, an example of the futility of prohibition when in the most secure... Uh, environments that we have as a society, both getting in and getting out of, uh, drug use is rampant, drug possession is rampant, it's sort of everywhere. You just simply can't stop it. The incentives are too high. And your story, I think, is a very compelling example of what, why we, we got to come back to Mark uh, Emery's uh, point, which is, you know, as a starting point, let's just stop punishing people for growing, selling, or possessing marijuana. Let's take punishment off the table, and then we can have a conversation and a dialogue about sensible policies that allow us to otherwise uh, deal with uh, marijuana in a regulatory way, like we sort of regulate just about everything else in our society. And we can have a variety of opinions on what the proper scope of the regulatory model is. How tight should it be? What things should be regulated? Uh, are we taking a public health approach? Are we taking a libertarian approach? Are we taking a, 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 a green focus to it? Uh, but I'd sure rather have that discussion with marijuana not being prohibited than have that discussion now, when it's currently illegal to possess for just about everybody in this country. So let's, let's get to where Mark suggests we go. Stop punishing people for marijuana offenses. And then let's talk about what's the best way to deal with uh, what comes after. Dana, I know you're going to wrap up. Let me just tell you, I spent four and a half years in U.S. federal prisons. And the most inspiring thing that I ever saw was victory in Colorado victory in Washington, and Sensible BC getting 220,000 signatures, hundreds of great editorials, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of wonderful endorsements, and all the work was amazing. You know, people ask me, aren't you a bit bittersweet that you were in prison while they legalized in Washington State and the legislation was written by your prosecutor? And I said, no, he's the only guy who's ever tracked me down and hurt me that ever repented by his actions. Of course, I'm not upset with him. It was delightful to see Washington legalize marijuana insofar as that they have legalized marijuana. And Colorado is fabulous. It's got everything I want. No one goes to jail. People can grow their own. That's a terrific model. And Sensible BC made, I thought, you know, I, I heard people complaining, well, it's not enough. I thought, man, 220,000 people dedicated to this proposition shows you that this is a tremendous organization, a tremendous effort, and very inspiring. And it inspires people around the world. Every time something good happens in a, in a directional way, not everything we want, maybe decrim in Portugal, maybe legalization as they call it in Colorado, or maybe one dollar a gram in Uruguay, and all that sort of stuff, those things are immensely inspiring to every other activist around the world. So as long as you're doing something, and by the way, you have the most wonderful leadership in British Columbia under Dana Larson. Man, what a focused, directional, <laughs> inspiring person. But but it's not it's not just it's not just about you. What you do impacts on people everywhere in the globe. You can't underestimate how much people love to see other people succeed and get great things done. And so to me, this directional thing is the right way to go because every time somebody else moves forward, it inspires everybody else to push a little bit harder and that's how you get liberty. You got to keep doing it. Look what happened in Amsterdam. They got slack. It's quote legal for 40 years. And then when the government starts taking away it all, they don't even know what to do because they've never been politically organized. They're helpless, right? Canadians know what it's like to fight for freedom. We're doing it all the time in our movement and we're going to keep doing it and you're going to see great things. And I want to thank all of you and Dana Larson especially for doing a fabulous job of keeping me inspired while I was in prison in the United States. And I just, 
I, I agree, and I and even though I was somewhat hard on Dana and the organization for not having us on our website, I really appreciate the leadership as well. What what I do? What part of me? We'll talk about that after because I, I will. I, you should be on there. I'm not sure what. Okay. Anyways, <laughs> sorry. I I shouldn't have thrown you under a moving bus while I was on the stage. I should have talked about it before. What what I will say though is that is is that look. Um, it, the examples that, that uh, we have with, with jurisdictions around North America taking what may be, to some, baby steps, what others may seem to be giant steps, in politics we deal with the message box. And the message box is telling us stuff that, frankly, in, in a lot of cases just isn't true. It's not based on evidence. As my colleague in the legislature says, we engage in decision-based evidence-making. Okay, and, and, so, and, and, and he talks about this from a scientific perspective. So for every jurisdiction that takes one step forward, we get to see examples of where the message box of our, the federal conservatives or, or the BC liberals or, or whoever else breaking down. I mean, what's, the, I, what's the name of your, of your governor in Colorado? John Hickenlooper. John Hickenlooper was against this and to see him in Forbes magazine backtracking and changing the message that that he went out with is incredibly refreshing and it's a, and, it, and it actually in the long run having those uh, having those front runners do what they're doing allows us to maybe create an even better uh, scenario here for British Columbia and for Canada and we are and I agree we're going to have to take steps provincially because we don't have the full control over it. So thank you to Sensible BC for inviting us here today and um, for, the, for the great audience and we will continue to, to work on this for sure. Thank you. Uh, let's, we're supposed to end here around quarter past five and it's 527. I could take another question. Okay, you got your hand up really fast. We'll take one from you. You got two hands up. Yeah. Uh, try to keep it short. Yeah, sure. So um, Mark mentioned we have a great opportunity in 2015, and we do. But I think the opportunity isn't um, so much what Mark is talking about. It's an opportunity to get rid of the government that is back in Canada. We have a government that's, that's contemplating bills like S4, C13, that are going to take away our privacy, uh, allow corporations to give our data to other corporations. Uh, we've seen bad laws get passed around the Constitution. Uh, we've seen omnibus... Uh, budget bills with things buried in there that nobody has any idea what they are, uh, how they're going to work, and yet they're expected to vote on them and approve them if they're on the uh, conservative side. Uh, we've seen a gathering of power into the uh, PMO's office. We've seen the Duffy scandal, all the rest of it. Um, it's a government that needs to go. It has no uh, regard yes, for democracy whatsoever. I mean, everybody here agrees the Harper government is bad, but are we going to fraction that amongst four other parties, or are we going to focus on one get them elected, be my spot, and stop the Harper party? Let let me, me, okay, but let, let, let me finish my, my, my question. So, so really where the, all this is going is the Conservatives get a lot of their support from senior citizens. And if we have, as Mark suggests, the number one priority in the election is legalization, is there a risk? that that will allow the Conservative government to continue to fearmonger to the rest of Canada and yes. jeopardize the Harper government being replaced. So they've been, well, the Liberals have copped the polls for 17 months now, it hasn't affected, and they've talked about marijuana, and the Harper's <coughs> Conservatives have tried to demonize Trudeau and advertising in all the ethnic communities for months, and have basically tried to demonize, heck, they demonized me five times in Parliament alone, I'm just an ordinary citizen. And five MPs have got up to denounce me in the last six months in Parliament. So clearly they, they're hating on us, but it's not working. But the advertising hasn't started. The election well, hasn't started. Election it, it, it has started. But the real election advertising Well, I would say that ours is a different panel. Well, I would say that, you know, our, our job is to make sure that's not the case. You know, and to, and to do that work, you know, Trudeau's come out with support of marijuana, legalization, whatever you feel about their other policies, whatever you feel about the Liberals, it is very positive to have a party leader from one of the big three parties come out for legalization. And when that person leads in the polls, it continues to lead in the polls after being hammered on it repeatedly, that does bode very well for, for our movement. And hopefully we'll embolden other politicians to come out and say that as well. Because you see it's not hurting them. You know, if Trudeau had said that, and then he'd gone down to the polls and lost by-elections, that would have been a disaster. They would have backed away from it and been like, oh, this isn't working. we got to 
talk about something else, but it seems to me that it's really come forward, and I hope that it will allow uh, the NDP to come out on it more, and I hope that it will allow other parties provincially to start talking about it more, and that it's now no longer something to be afraid of. Because I think politicians are always afraid. You talk about pot, they make some Cheech and Chong jokes, everyone's laughing at you, and then you're out the door. But, uh, you know, in, in British Columbia anyways, our, the polling that we did uh, showed that senior support legalization of marijuana, liberals, NDP, Green Party, even a majority of Conservative Party voters in British Columbia uh, said that they support, it's a thin majority, but that they support legalization of marijuana as well. So there is uh, room for that in all the parties. And, and I think that this could be an issue that divides some of the Conservatives, because the Conservative Party is a coalition of libertarians and social conservatives. And the libertarians kind of put up with the drug and marijuana stuff because they support the, the low taxes or the firm hand on the economy or whatever they think they're getting. But the more marijuana becomes an issue, and the more this is what defines them, I think some of those folks might find themselves not feeling so comfortable with the Soviet Party. But you do make some good points. Um, okay, we'll take one more, but you can go <laughs> speak. Yeah, yeah, no, just, just, just a quick ask here. I feel uh, confident that the proactive nature of everybody kind of involved in this culture, in this movement, um, and such initiatives as Grannies for Grass and Fathers for Flowers, uh, definitely going to educate the older population yeah. and, and the voting population before the election. So I would say let's keep moving forward with what's going on here and keep with with everything that we've, we've built towards. That's a great note to end on. Thank you very much. <laughs>